So now let's talk about other special senses, uh, affection, gustation, and audition. First, uh, let's talk about the affection. As I mentioned, all sensory systems have two parts, peripheral part and central part. For affection, the peripheral part is the nose, right? Smell. Peripheral organ is what? The nose. Inside the nose, you have olfactory receptors. Okay? Where? Inside the nose, you have the olfactory receptors. You see, this is the nasal cavity. And inside the nasal cavity, you have the receptors mostly located in the upper part of the nasal cavity around here in this area okay and from the receptors smell signal enters into this important structure that is called the olfactory bulb and who takes the smell signal from the receptors to the olfactory bulb, these nerve fibers. These are called the olfactory nerve fibers. Okay? So, inside the nose, you have the receptors. From the receptors, olfactory nerve fibers take the signal to the olfactory bulb. And <coughs> olfactory bulb sits on the cribriform plate of ethmoid bone. How many of you remember cribriform plate of ethmoid? Remember uh, in the skull, there are tiny holes of olfactory foramina? Okay, so that's the cribriform plate in olfactory, um, uh, uh, in the ethmoid bone. So here, this is the cribriform plate, that piece of bone. And in that, you have many tiny holes, you have seen that. Those are the olfactory foramina. So you see olfactory nerve fibers pass through the olfactory foramina of the cribriform plate of ethmoid and enter into the olfactory bulb. And then from the olfactory bulb, you see that olfactory tract. This is the olfactory tract, takes the signal to different brain structures. Now let me ask you, peripheral organ for olfactory system is what? Nose, everybody. I'll ask individual. Okay. Then inside the nose, in the upper part of nasal cavity, you have the what? Upper part of the nasal cavity, you have those receptors called the olfactory receptors. Make sense? From the olfactory receptors, who take the signal to the olfactory bulb? olfactory nerve fibers, right? And olfactory nerve fibers pass through which piece of bone? Give you from play. Of which bone? Ethmoid bone. Is it clear? Then from there, you. From there, olfactory bulb. After look at me. Olfactory bulb receives the signal from the olfactory nerve fibers. So this is the give from plate, okay? Give you from plate is here. And you have many tiny holes, those are called what? Those tiny holes are called what? How many times I said? Foramina. And you have seen in the bones, olfactory foramina. So olfactory nerve fibers pass through the olfactory foramina, right? And on the cribriform plate, which structure is sitting there? Olfactory bulb, right? sitting there. So, olfactory nerve fibers enter into the olfactory bulb. Make sense? And then from the olfactory bulb, the olfactory tract takes the signal to different brain structures. That's the pathway, okay? Olfactory pathway. <coughs> so, which structures receive signal from the olfactory tract? Let's see here. From the olfactory tract, signal goes to the 
olfactory cortex, hypothalamus, amygdala, and limbic system. Those structures receive the signal. Hypothalamus, uh, sorry, olfactory cortex, hypothalamus, amygdala, and the limbic system. Four brain structures receive the signal from the olfactory tract, right? Now, why four structures should receive signal from the olfactory tract? Smell signal. Olfactory cortex gives you the smell. What kind of a smell is that? Is that a mango or an orange or you know something else? That is given by the olfactory cortex. Make sense? Hypothalamus is mainly responsible for memory. Like if you smell orange, okay, without looking the orange, you can tell this is what an orange, right? Make sense? If I give you the smell of mango without looking at the mango, you can tell this is what mango. Make sense? So how you know that from your memory is it clear from your past experience or memory that is stored in the hypothalamus is it clear and amygdala and limbic system these structures are mainly responsible for emotion is affection related to emotion what do you think smell is related to emotion Yes, no? You know when a small baby cries, infant cries, right? It's during sleep. If mom goes close, the baby smells, right? And stop crying. So smell is very much related to emotion. Okay? So amygdala and limbic system, those brain structures are strongly related to what? Emotion. Is it clear? That's why the signal should go different to different structures. Cortex is giving you what kind of a smell? What is that, right? Is it orange, apple, or banana, or mango? Is it clear? That is given by olfactory cortex, that perception. Now, hypothalamus gives what? Stores memory, right? So if you smell once, you can tell. Like, you know, some olfactory signals are uh, stored for many throughout the life. Like, if when you are small, you know, uh, your mom used to cook good food, right? Now, after many years, if you eat same food, you can tell, right? You can connect that you smelled that, you had that taste, right? So taste, smell, those are very strongly related to memory and emotion. Is it clear? Okay. So that's why you need those other structures. Uh, olfactory signal bypasses the thalamus. We know that thalamus is the major sensory relay station, right? Almost, I said at that time, almost all sensory signals are relayed in the thalamus, but not all. Make sense? Almost all. So, this is an exception. Olfactory signal is not relayed in the thalamus. So, let's now go back. This is the nasal epithelium this part. If I just take the epithelium lining here and see under the microscope, this is how it will look like. This. In the nasal epithelium, you have three types of cells. You see here, by three different colors. These yellow cells, these are neuron-like cells. You see that dendrite, axon, cell body. So these are called the olfactory receptor cells, neuron-like cells. And these cells are called the supporting cells. And these cells, shown by blue color here, are basal cells. So if I ask you what are the three types of cells in the nasal epithelium, those are the cells. Olfactory receptor cells, supporting cells and basal cells. <clears throat> now, let's see the olfactory receptor cell. It is 
is a neuron like cell so it has a cell body axon this is the cell body this is the axon this is the cribriform plate of ethmoid so this is the olfactory foramina here through which the axon or olfactory nerve fiber same thing pass this is the nucleus cell body and this is the dendrite and at the end of the dendrite you have cilia okay at the end of the dendrite you have cilia and the receptors are attached to the cilia like this so these are the receptors Now, if I put a piece of cake in front of you, okay, so from that cake, smell molecules float in the air, okay, and enter into the nose. Do you see that? Yes or no? Okay. You don't see the smell molecules, right? You only see the cake and the smell. But something enters into the nose from there, right? So, smell molecules are so small, so tiny that you don't even see them. Make sense? They can float in the air and enter into the nose. Okay, so smell molecules are very small and enter into the nose and bind with the receptors. So these are the smell molecules or olfactory molecules. Okay bind with the receptors and when that attachment or binding occurs the receptors are activated okay so to activate the receptors you need the signal molecules smell molecules okay to get attached to them when that happens the signal travels this way we know that dendrites take the signal to the cell body and cell body sends the signal out through the axon this is the axon which is also called olfactory nerve fibers. Same thing. Olfactory nerve fibers are these axons. Is it clear? So they pass through the cribriform plate and enters into the olfactory ball. So here you have the olfactory ball. Receptors, same thing, cilia, receptors, okay, and when the signal arrives here in the olfactory bulb, inside the olfactory bulb you have the neurons. These are called the mitral cells. You see, inside the olfactory bulb you have the mitral cells. And these are the dendrites of mitral cells receive the signal, you know, synapse, synapse, and these are the mitral cells. Okay, they receive the signal, and the axon of these mitral cells bundle together to form the tract olfactory. Tract. So, olfactory tract is actually the bundle of the axons of mitral cells. You see the picture now, it will make sense. Okay, so let's quickly uh, review. This is the olfactory receptor cell, and at the end of the dendrites, you have cilia, soft hair like structure, cilia. And on the cilia, you have the receptors, right? Receptors are attached to the cilia. When you smell molecules enter into the nose, nasal cavity, they bind with the receptors. 
and that activates the cell. And cell will send signal to the olfactory bulb, right? Inside the olfactory bulb, which cells receive that signal? Mitral cells. Is it clear? And the axons of mitral cells button together to form the olfactory tract. And this tract, now let's go back. This tract will take the signal to four different structures. Olfactory cortex, to give you what kind of smell is that? Hypothalamus, to give you the memory, store the signal as memory, and amygdala and limbic system. Amygdala and limbic system for emotion. You remember four brain structures receive the signal from the olfactory tract. Olfactory cortex, hypothalamus, amygdala, and limbic system. Is it clear? Make sense? Okay. Now, if the olfactory nerve fibers are destroyed, here. Yeah. If the olfactory nerve fibers are damaged or destroyed, then signal will not go to the brain. Make sense? The person will lose the ability to smell. And that is called what? Anosmia. Have you heard that? No? If the olfactory nerve fibers are destroyed, signal will not go to the brain. And that will cause anosmia. No smell perception. Absence of the perception of smell. A means absence, anosmia. You see here, uh, this is a weak point the cribriform plate of death wire, if something hits this piece of bone, then what can happen? These nerve fibers can be damaged. Make sense? Like if you hit that bone, that, nerve, that can crush the nerve fibers, right? And signal will not go to the brain. That can cause anosmia. That happens due to movement of the cribriform plate. <coughs> Sometimes we see the patient who smells but not enough, not strong, and that is called there is a clinical condition that is called uh, phantosmia. A person smells, but it smells something different. Okay? Phantom. Even uh, the patient complains that uh, he smells something strong, although there is no source of, you know, smell. So nothing to smell, but the person smells. So that's why it is called phantom. Phantosme. <clears throat> so, uh, that is the olfactory system. Just a few things you need to know. Uh, where the receptors are located in the epithelium. Which other cells are present in the epithelium? You have the receptor cells. Other cells are supporting cells and basal cells. Now, know that the basal cells are stem cells. This is, this is important. The basal cells are stem cells and can produce new receptor cells. So new cells are produced from the basal cells. Uh, you know, often we get infection, right? Basal infection is also common and that kills many cells. And you lose the, you know, uh, smell perception, but quickly the basal cells produce new cells. That's why, you know, your smell uh, is not, the ability is not destroyed. Gustatory system, a taste, the peripheral organ 
is the tongue. On the surface of the tongue, if you see, you will see many tiny structures. Those are called papilla. So this is the tongue. You will see many tiny structures on the tongue. These are called papilla. Now there are four different types of papilla in the tongue. In the front part of the tongue, you have filiform papilla and another type is called fungiform papilla. In the back part of the tongue, you have two other types of papilla. Some papilla form inverted V, you see here, kind of arrangement, and these papilla are called circumvallate. They are pretty large and not many. These are circumvallate papilla. And in the back part, both sides of the tongue, you have this papilla, these are called foliate. So these are four types of papilla in the tongue and their locations. <coughs> foliate, you see here, in the back part of the tongue, you have foliate in both sides and circumvallate on the top, on the surface. In the front part, you have fungiform, and another type of papilla that you can show here, filiform. Okay. Filiform papilla, these are not very useful because no taste bar or no taste receptors are present inside the filiform papilla. But in other three types of papilla, you have taste bars and taste receptors. That's why the others are important. Okay. Now if I see from large to small, tongue is the largest. On the tongue, you have the papilla. Now if I take a papilla and open it, inside the papilla, I will find taste Bards. Now, if I open the taste bud, I will see the taste receptors, receptor cells. And in the taste receptor cells, you have the receptors. That's why these are called taste receptor cells. Okay? So that is from large to small. Tongue, papilla, then the taste bars, taste receptor cells, and then the receptors. Receptors are, as you already know, very tiny structures like this, protein structures. Okay. Now, these two you can see from outside. You can see from outside. If you see the tongue, you can see the tongue. You can see the papilla on the tongue. These are inside. You don't see. You don't see this. Why? Because taste, taste bars are located inside the papilla. And inside the taste bud, you have the receptor cells. And on the receptor cells, you have the receptors. Now let's see one papilla. If I take one papilla and open it, I will see inside the papilla, taste bars are like this, like oranges. So this is one taste bar inside the papilla. Okay? In the top part of the taste bar, you have opening called taste 
pore. Pore is the opening, you know that. So this is the part. Test bar. <coughs> Inside the test bar, this is in important and interesting. You have the inside the test bars, you have the test receptor cells, right? So let's see the test receptor cells. This is one test receptor cell. Start right. This is another test receptor cell. This is another test receptor cell. Let me use another one. This is another test receptor cell. So these are the test receptor cells inside the test bar. Okay. Nucleus, we know that inside the cell you have nucleus. Now, at the upper end of the cells, you have here like this. Okay. At the upper end of the receptor cells, you have the here. And on the here, you have the receptors. These are the receptors. So receptors are very tiny structures, okay? Attached to the here of the receptor cells. Now, what happens, you see, when you eat the food, the food molecules are in the mouth, on the tongue, and these food molecules, breakdown of food molecules uh, occur, you know that, and the food, tiny food molecules enter through the taste pore into the taste bar and get attached to the receptors. You remember the attachment of molecule and the receptor is very important. Okay? So all these receptors now get activated since the food molecules that attached to them and that will send signal to the cell and from the cell the signal will get out like this axon of these cells right so the axons of these cells will take the signal out from the test bar and then from the tongue. So these are the axons. Okay? And all these axons together form the nerve that takes the signal out. Okay? Now, why inside the test bar I showed different colors? Because you have different taste receptor cells. For example, this one is for sweet. Make sense? This one is for sour. This one is for what? For say, bitter. Make sense? You have different tastes, right? You have umami, another type of taste. So that's why inside the taste bar, you have different types of taste receptor cells. Make sense? Some are for sweet, some are for sour, some are for bitter, some are for other tastes, okay? So uh, if you eat something sweet, this cell will be activated. If you eat something sour, this cell will be activated. Make sense? If you eat uh, like, most of the food are like a mixture, right? Of sweet, sour, and other other uh, tastes, basic tastes. 
So these are called the basic basic tests. We can create other many other types of tests by combining this. Right? That's why the food tests, right? So many different tests. Um, it's important. So <clears throat> did you get it? So who is the peripheral organ for gustation or taste? Tongue, very good. And on the surface of the tongue, you see those tiny structures. Those are called what? Papilla, papilla right? How many different types of papilla? Four. Four. Foliate, circumvallate, right? Those are in the back part of the tongue. And fungiform and filiform. Make sense? Which one doesn't have the taste bud or taste receptors? Filiform. Other three have taste buds and taste receptors. Okay. And taste bud inside the papilla, uh, if you see under a very powerful microscope, they are like oranges, okay? So you can peel, you know that you, you can, you know, take the skin off, right? Now let's take the taste bud and open it. Inside the taste bud, you have the slices. Inside the orange, you have what? Segments or slices, right? So the receptor cells are like that inside the taste bud, make sense? Like slices. And those receptor cells have hair-like structures. Those are uh, the hair and the receptors are attached to the hair. When the food molecules enter into the taste bud, they get attached to the receptors of the hair and that activates the cell, cells, receptor cells and the signal will get out through the axons of those cells, okay? Is it clear that, that much? Okay, now we know that cranial nerve is the bundle of those axons of those receptor cells, okay? Take out the signal from the tongue. Which cranial nerves take the signal out from the tongue? Here you see facial, glossopharyngeal. Those are taking the signal out from the tongue. Facial is mainly from the front part of the tongue, glossopharyngeal from the back part or dorsal part of the tongue as well as from the pharynx. Your pharynx also has some taste receptors. So that's why glosso means tongue, pharyngeal is pharynx. So glosso, pharyngeal. Glosso means tongue. So facial nerve and glossopharyngeal nerve. These two cranial nerves take the signal, taste signal out from the tongue towards the brain. And this is called the soft palate. It's outside of the tongue. You have some taste receptors there too. Vagus nerve takes the taste signal out from the soft palate. So from the tongue, basically facial and glossopharyngeal. And from outside of the tongue, uh, vagus from the soft palate. You need to know those three. If I ask you which three cranial nerves test, uh, uh, take the taste signal to the brain, these are the three cranial nerves, facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus. And they take the signal to a structure in the medulla oblongata of the brain. And that is called the solitary nucleus in the medulla of the brain. Receives the signal from those cranial nerves. And from there, the signal will definitely go to the thalamus, which is the major sensory relay station, right? So from the solitary nucleus to the thalamus. And then from the thalamus, signal will go to few brain structures. Which brain structures you see here? Gustatory cortex that gives you the taste immediate. What is that? Is it the taste of a, an orange or a mango? Make sense? 
that is given by the gustatory cortex. And limbic system and amygdala, you already know. Uh, for the emotion and hypothalamus is for the memory to store that if you eat something right you can tell that you ate it before or not you know that so that's the memory so uh, same structures that is stores uh, and gives emotion for all friction so that's the gustatory system okay So let me write it down, uh, then we will go to the, uh, move to the auditory, okay. So from the receptor cells, uh, three cranial nerves, cranial nerve number seven is called facial nerve, cranial nerve number nine is called glosso. Pharyngeal nerve and cranial nerve number 10 is vagus nerve. So these three cranial nerves take the signal to the medulla oblongata. Inside the medulla you have solitary nucleus that receives the signal, taste signal. From the solitary nucleus, signal goes to the thalamus. And from the thalamus, signal goes to auditory, uh, sorry, olfactory, not olfactory, gustatory cortex, gustatory cortex that gives you the taste, then hypothalamus for memory and limbic system or emotion or emotion okay so that's the path gustatory path okay <coughs> loss of taste is called a gaussia. No taste. The perception of taste is lost. The person is eating but no taste. A gaussia. A G E U S I A. This gaussia. distorted taste. So the person is eating something, uh, he, he, is, uh, he is able to taste but the taste is not exactly the taste of that food. Distorted taste. Uh, Phantogelsia. Phantogelsia. No food on the tongue or in the mouth, but the person tastes. So that is weird, right? So that's why it is called phantogelsia. No food, but the person tastes the food. Okay? So that is phantogelsia. So those are uh, some, you know, abnormal uh, conditions. <clears throat> auditory system. Another special sense is audition or hearing. Tell me who are the peripheral organs for hearing? Ears. So if you see the anatomy of the ear, it has three parts, outer ear or external ear, middle ear and inner or internal ear. So let's see those three parts. 
So this part is the external or outer ear. That includes pinna. This is the pinna, lobule. This is the lobule, right? You know that. So pinna, lobule, and helix. The edge. And external acoustic meatus, outer ear canal that you can see from outside the canal. That's the external acoustic meatus. Is it clear? So these structures belong to the external or outer ear. The middle ear is a cavity inside the temporal bone. You know the bone here, this is the temporal bone. Inside the temporal bone, you have a cavity, that's the middle ear. Inside the middle ear, you see here, there are three tiny bones, very small bones. These are called ossicles. So three ossicles. So in the middle ear, you have three ossicles or tiny bones. And also not shown in this picture, in middle ear you have two small or tiny muscles. Okay, so these are the structures in the middle ear. Middle, okay. three ossicles or tiny bones and two tiny muscles. Now, you see here, this structure is called the ear drum or tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane or ear drum. That separates the external and middle ear. So it is basically a partition between external and middle ear. Okay. Tympanic membrane or ear drum. <coughs> And this is the inner ear or internal ear. And that part is very important. The inner ear is the most important part because you have a coiled, hard, bony structure, looks like a snail filled with fluid. I'm repeating again. In the inner ear, you have a hard, oil, snail-like, bony structure filled with what? Fluid. And this structure is called the cochlea. So inner ear has cochlea. Okay? That's the most important structure of your ear. Why? Why retina is the most important structure of the eye? Anybody? Receptors are there, right? Cochlea is the most important structure of the ear because the receptors are in the cochlea. Make sense? Hear receptors or sound receptors are in the cochlea. Is it clear? Okay. In the inner ear, you have two other structures. This part is called the vestibule. And these are semicircular canals. So vestibule and semicircular canals. There are three semicircular canals. So these are the structures present in the inner ear. Cochlea contains the sound receptors sound receptors are hair cells hair cells okay just know that these two structures vestibule and semicircular canals are responsible for balance Possible for the balance of the body. 
because they can detect the movement of your head. They, they can detect the movement of your head, head movement. Okay, so they help to balance the body. So you see, in inner ear, you have the cochlea, which has nothing to do with balance, which is responsible for sound. And you have vestibule and semicircular canals. They are not related to sound at all. They are responsible for the head position and balance. Make sense? Now you tell me if these structures are destroyed or you know uh, not functioning, then what will happen? The person will lose the balance. Make sense? That is called vertigo. Have you heard that? That happens if uh, you know long ear infection or you know something wrong in the ear inside there that can cause vertigo okay yes. okay so those are three parts of the ear let's quickly go back so peripheral organs are what for sound 